the 16th edition of MIPDOC and the first event of our conference, the MIPDOC Mentorship Session. I should like to introduce you to our mentors who have kindly accepted here to, to be here today and make sure that your pitch stands out above everybody else's and gets your project off the ground. Please welcome Daniela Bagliani from RTI, Tracy Beckett, National Geographic, Dinah Lord, BBC Channel 4, Leila Monks, RD, um, TVF, Olaf Grunart, Arte, Ove Jansen, EDN, Gary Lyko, Cable Ready, and Mark Servit, CBC. Right. Thank you very much. Have a good morning. My name is Simon Shapps. I'm the chairman of Mercury Media. Um, I was trying to check how many of these sessions, what Dubai want, what the buyers want, um, we've had at MIPDOC, uh, and uh, we couldn't verify, but we think this is the second, so this is well on the way to becoming a regular annual event. Uh, can I just check? Before I introduce the panel and we begin the session, can I just check who the audience is? Uh, can you raise your hand if you are a distributor? Yeah, interesting. Can you raise your hand if you're a producer? Ah. <laughs> oh, well, well, we'll try a slightly different session in that case. Uh, if you're a broadcaster, and by the way, you can leave early just in case you get pursued by the producers. <laughs> and journalists, have you slipped through the net? Any journalists? Okay, anybody who has now realized they've come to complete the wrong session uh, and they were actually looking to buy a flat in the south of France? <laughs> okay, nobody like that. Okay, well, uh, you're all welcome. Um, we're going to ask you a question in a minute, but before we ask you the question, and those of you who were here last year may remember what that question was, we may even ask you if your answer is the same or different, which is about your degree of optimism or pessimism about uh, the, doc the documentary market internationally. But before we do that, let me just very quickly introduce um, what is really a, a terrifically uh, strong uh, and diverse panel. Uh, on my left, we have Michelle Bagliebter, who is the manager, the manager of Global Acquisitions for Nat Geo. Next to her, we have Mustafa Nagy, who, uh, he tells me for the last month anyway, has been the head of programs for Al Jazeera Documentary Channel. So welcome and congratulations uh, on your new role. To my right is Carol Sennett, uh, executive producer, uh, uh, acquisitions for BBC uh, Knowledge. And to her right is Laurent Sakuri, the head of acquisitions for the Planet Channels and Canal Plus. So welcome to all of our panelists. So let me just very quickly, before we get on to the meat of this, which is unashamedly to try and answer the question, what the buyers want, let me just ask uh, the people here a question. And the question is this. In the last 12 months, have you become more optimistic or more pessimistic about the opportunities for documentary production and distribution. So it's a very simple, I feel better about stuff, I feel worse about stuff. Those of you who feel more optimistic, can you raise your hands? Oh God, this is gonna be tricky. Are those of you, uh, by the way, you can't abstain, just in case you were thinking of abstaining. Okay, no abstaining, it's not the vote on the, it's not the referendum on the sing, single transferable vote in the UK where most people will probably abstain, but um, uh, uh, those of you um, who feel um, pessimistic. Well, that's really interesting. Uh, I have to say, uh, without a trace of complacency, that we kind of predicted that. Because what we have here on the panel, I think uh, and we may come to this, is a little bit more skepticism and pessimism than we had from the panel last year. And last year, the audience were really, really pessimistic, but they've become more optimistic. So the lesson here is the people who are actually acquiring the programs will always disagree with the people actually trying to sell them. They will be like ships in the night. Uh, 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 but that's a kind of interesting take. So the panelists um, were a bit more cautiously pessimistic, maybe less money, maybe more complications about rights, um, maybe some consolidation and possibly some op uh, fewer opportunities, although that wasn't by any means a universal view. Okay, what we're going to do, and we're gonna try and rattle through this in about 25 minutes, so bear with us, is to go across the panel and ask each of the panelists to give, them, uh, to give us a flavor of the acquisitions that their particular organizations are making. And once they've shown uh, a tape, 
uh, then to talk a bit more generally about the strategy that underlies what it is that you've seen on the tape. So we're going to try and rattle through that relatively quickly in order to give us plenty of time to take questions from the audience. OK, so can I ask Michelle to kick off? And Michelle is going to kick off uh, with a tape of some of the things that you'll see on that geo. Hello? Oh, yes. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll kick off with the tape. And it is just um, some recently um, developed, actually, series. I didn't do just acquisitions, because I really wanted to give you guys a taste of what's working on our networks. Um, not just stuff that we've acquired. So we can just roll, roll tape. the tape. I landed at JFK. There was my dad, his hair all silver, and uh Once again, uh, I'm a little boy, and my father's taking care of me. Still feel guilty about it. Oh, terribly guilty. Terribly guilty. There he goes. And the truck's in the river. The truck is in the river, and uh, it's sinking. Smugglers know the border runs down the middle of the river, but agents only have jurisdiction over the American side. If smugglers can get the drugs into the middle of the river, they probably won't be prosecuted for trying to take them back to Mexico. Britain's finest unit for forensic investigation is embarking on a new and groundbreaking mission. They're experts in human identification using the full arsenal of modern technology. But now, for the first time, they're applying these skills to bodies from the long, distant past. He certainly had a nasty crack to the top of his head. That must have been so painful. So we've got the face, the facial reconstruction, and we added some textures. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. That, that, that is just super. <laughs> This is History Cold Case. Everyone, on battle stations. Up, up. Oh, my God. We're yeah. moving. Everybody up. Everybody up. We've uh, located a second sound machine. Sure we're, uh, landing at this time. Okay. Um, so I just want to give everyone a sense of um, how we're buying at uh, National Geographic. We are a little complicated, which I understand. Um, so we are now a global organization, um, U.S. and international. We buy for the world. We can buy globally for everyone, we can buy regionally um, for individual territories, or we can also buy uh, pan-regionally for, let's say, Italy and Latin America. Um, we're also buying for three different channels and a kids block. So we're buying for our core channel, um, which is, you know, a lot of our insides, our history, mystery, um, strands, some religion. Then we're buying for adventure. Um, which is not in the U.S., it's just international. Uh, that is a lot of kind of lifestyle travel um, programming. And then we're also buying for Wild, which is now global um, in the U.S. as well. Uh, all HD, beautiful natural history. We've got um, a lot of character-driven series, a lot of blue chip, blue chip specials. Um, and also we've got a kids block in Turkey, which we're buying for as well. Um, just something that I wanted to note really quickly is we have a very strong brand and our brand dictates a lot of our programming, but also our programming does differ from what you would typically see in our magazine. So it's just something to consider when I'd say pitching to National Geographic channels. Um, I'd say in terms of what we're looking for. Globally, we're really looking for strong characters. You can tell from the tape, they're very strong characters, a lot of emotion involved, a lot of action. 
Um, and we're also looking for big event specials, a lot of science specials. We did a show a few years back called um, Five Years on Mars, and it's just a really great example of um, how you can uniquely do science. It wasn't an acquisition, it was co-produced for the channel, um, but they basically put personalities to these two rovers on Mars. And it was just a new way to look at science and these rovers on Mars. And it has done very well for us and it kind of elicited this emotion um, for a show about rovers, which was really interesting and just a nice way to do it, I think. I Shell, think. can I just chip in? If, if we were looking at the equivalent tape next year, mm -hmm. um, could you um, give us a glimpse of the kinds of things that you think might be coming trends on that na na National Geo? Because to some extent, some of those, you know, that, that type of programming we've been reasonably familiar with. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you give us any flavor of the, the next generation of shows or the new things? Yeah, I think that definitely um, more and more character-driven series. We're really gonna be working and um, developing and acquiring a lot of those. Um, also, our specials, our one-offs um, that we do are going to be really, really strong. Um, really unique science, very, I'd say, glossy, everything HD. Um, but in terms of trends, it's really, really those series that's going to make a difference. I'd say. And any any clues about genres? Any particular? You know, have you done too much of something and not enough of something else, or is there something new that you guys would like to see on Nat Geo? Yeah, I think that we're um, we've done a lot of crime and a lot of edgy shows, which work really, really well for us. Um, but the trick is trying to keep that balance between the crime and um, your kind of typical National Geographic, which you, which you think of, which is a lot of science. Um, and so I think we're probably going to tone down the crime a little bit and up a little bit more of the traditional Nat Geo stuff, but make it a little bit more, make sure it's very innovative and unique. Great. Okay. That, that, that's really clear. And, and certainly people in the audience uh, uh, will have plenty of opportunities to ask you uh, uh, more questions about that. Uh, can we go to Mustafa now? And actually, when I introduced Mustafa, I said he'd been in his role for a month. That doesn't mean to say that he's only been in television for a month. Uh, he's been in television for some 20 years or so. Uh, yeah. yeah, 15, maybe. Uh, yeah, 20 years or so. Uh, yeah, and been, uh, and been with, Net, uh, with uh, Al Jazeera since 2005? Yes. Is that right? Okay. The floor is yours. Right. Uh, okay, I'd like to also uh, kick off with a little uh, clip that we've prepared for you guys just to give you a flavor of, of what... Uh, uh, what we have on our screens uh, at the moment, so I hope this video works. We are go for Mars entry. step, every moment captured, always on Al Jazeera documentary. Right, so um, you can see that we've got a very huge, uh, you know, a variety of things. So I'd like to start quickly with just saying uh, who, are, 
who we are. And HD is a dedicated documentary channel, uh, and we broadcast in full in Arabic, so it's all in Arabic all the time. Uh, it's 24 hours a day, uh, 365 days uh, a year, and we launched in 2007. Um, and we offer a very wide range of documentaries on culture, science, as you, can see, you saw from the clip, uh, th that we look uh, culture, science, environment, history, travel, politics, and the arts. So this is the kind of genres that we cover, plus others, of course. And I'll uh, tell you a little bit more. Uh, Al Jazeera documentary is aligned uh, with the overall mission of Al Jazeera Network, which uh, hopefully everybody here is, uh, is aware of. And that is of uh, promoting public awareness uh, of issues of local and global uh, concern. And really, Al Jazeera aspires to be a bridge between peoples and cultures and to support the right of individuals to acquire information, knowledge, uh, and to strengthen the values of tolerance, democracy, uh, and the respect of liberties and human rights. So uh, you can see from there, this is what kind of things that we are really looking for. Uh, our footprint is actually in the MENA region uh, with a population of nearly uh, 298 million. Uh, I know that some people would uh, differ in the figures, but uh, you know, this is the approximate figure of the MENA region, which is the Middle East and North Africa. Um, our reach by age, age group, I've, I've given you here a quick glimpse of our age groups, uh, and what we're really looking to increase is the 25 uh, to 45 age group uh, range. Uh, so this is the kind of uh, target audience that we're trying to uh, increase uh, the people uh, watching us. And also uh, reached by, uh, by gender. So as you can see, we are predominantly uh, viewed by male audiences and 28% only female. So we're looking for genres that uh, would interest uh, female audiences because obviously, hopefully next year, if Simon's gonna ask me uh, how it's gonna look, I hope this pie would be more uh, uh, female uh, viewerships. Female and younger. And younger, yes. Yeah. Uh, which is the, ma the, the you know, majority of the population of the, of yeah. the region as well. Uh, quickly, I'll just go through uh, production and just tell you that we've produced more than 500 hours uh, of documentary films between 2007 and 2010. Uh, our objective and our aim is to produce uh, about 250 hours this year, inshallah. Uh, uh, AGD uh, champions the promotion of the documentary culture in the Arab world, uh, and we currently work with over 100 companies and independent producers worldwide. Uh, so you can imagine we are really uh, trying to support this industry. Uh, which is something that we've got a great passion for. Uh, I will uh, now just run a quick, uh, our latest production is called Music Stations. It's being broadcast currently on Al Jazeera Documentary. Uh, Al Jazeera English have just uh, asked for it as well, so they are gonna be broadcasting it uh, in an English version. And that's just a one minute clip to give you a taster of the kind of things that we are producing. <laughs> عوالم لم تكن لتخطر على بال قلبي بحبك شجي مغرم علاقة ارتبطت بمفاهيم الحياة أكحل عيني نظرها وسماء والساق يا ترويد شراء وما زال عم الخير بالثقافة والعادات بالحداثة والنضال والأمل بمستقبل واعد محطات موسيقية على الجزيرة الوثائقية This is really our latest production that we produce, and as, as you can see, it's very uh, colorful and entertaining, and that's why I think Al Jazeera English will also broadcast it after they've uh, translated it into English. So uh, these are the kind of things that we're interested about, about, you know, like cultural issues and the things related to the Middle East. Um, right, this is a quick summary of the genres that we produced, uh, just to give you a glimpse of uh, where we're driving our, our, our future uh, strategies. Uh, based on figures, uh, so we're looking more at scientific, so science is quite high on our agenda and we're trying to produce stuff that is related to science. Uh, uh, human rights, of course, is something as well that we are interested in. As, as I, I said at the beginning, the whole network and from the mission of the network, these are the things that we are pushing forward with. 
Okay. You want to see it again? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you told me to go quick. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, you're, doing, you're, you're doing really well. Keep going. All right. I'll, I'll keep going quick. <laughs> Uh, so uh, now we go to programs, and just to give you an idea that uh, we are buying nearly 1,200 hours. Uh, don't grab your calculators right away. I can see people, you know, uh, looking uh, at this. And um, we are open to co-producing from around the world, of course. Uh, and what we're looking for really is sports, something that uh, we are very proud that we are bringing the World Cup to 2022 to the Arab world for the first time. So we've won the World Cup right, so we're looking for things that are related to sport. We love our sport. Uh, well, all, all, all sorts of sports. Uh, of course, targeting youth, which you saw why we're driving our strategies towards that. Are you taking notes now? Yes. Uh-oh. <laughs> Simon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, science, of course, uh, we're looking for edutainment, things that are related to edutainment, uh, to increase uh, that on, on our uh, screen, and the arts in all, uh, all uh, sub-genres as well. And just to give you a quick uh, idea of uh, the, the, the genres that were purchased in 2010, uh, this is how we uh, are looking at it, uh, just as well so that we can start looking at other areas uh, as you can see, it's very uh, diversified and we've got a great uh, number of things that we've purchased in 2010. And um, some of the other strategies quickly that I would like to just whiz through is that we're expanding to HD in 2012. So we're expecting all our uh, deliverables to be in HD, inshallah. Uh, other media that we're looking at were just actually uh, Thursday before I arrived, we launched our interactive website. Uh, it's full in Arabic, it's fully Arabic, so uh, to encourage uh, uh, that kind of uh, culture within uh, the region. Um, social networking, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube. Uh, we're looking also, at, uh, we've got an electronic magazine that we publish every quarter. It's very specialized, it's just about filmmaking and filmmaking for documentaries. Uh, we've also published a yearly book. We are into our second yearly book, which is just due to be published within the next couple of weeks. Uh, and of course, we're looking for uh, apps for smartphones and tablets uh, to make our, our uh, information available more, to, and, and more um, to a larger, a wider audience, especially the youth. Uh, uh, we've got quite a social uh, responsibility on our hands here. We interact with universities, cultural centers. Uh, of course, the environment is very important. We get involved in sponsoring events and festivals. Uh, the Trailblazer, we are sponsoring the Trailblazer lunch, which is in the Majestic just after right th uh, this session. Um, and we've also the African Documentary Festival in Spain, uh, the Latin American Film Festival in Canada, uh, because we are really, we are passionate about uh, filmmaking for documentaries. We are really wanting to support not only in the region, uh, but also worldwide. We've got a, a mission here that we're trying to embrace and, 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 and move forward. Uh, these are some of the awards. I won't uh, list them uh, because I think I've just run out of time about yeah. by 30 seconds. Uh, so I would like to thank you very much. I hope I've given you <laughs> glimpse of what the commentary channel is all about. I thought we might have to go straight to lunch. <laughs> okay, just one question very quickly before we come to Carol. Um, money. Um, how, would you, how, does your, how does your spend uh, What's compare? That? What's money? What's your budget? How much have you got? Well, you know, 1,200 hours per hour price? Uh, price? Well, you see, we, we treat that on an individual basis. So depending on the, the series and depending on, on, on whether we're doing with you a, a deal on, on several hours uh, yeah. and, and, and the number of runs. So there are, we don't have really a fixed okay, so, figure. So, so let me, without putting words into your mouth, put some words into your mouth. Um, uh, would it be fair to say that uh, if anybody assumes or believes that Al Jazeera are not paying competitive rates compared to some of the other major documentary acquirers and broadcasters, so they're probably wrong about that, that you will? Well, uh, they're probably wrong. Um, but again, you see, we're just broadcasting in the MENA region. Sure. And we uh, broadcast to an Arabic audience. Sure. And we've got the dubbing expenses. Sure. Uh, uh, so if you're wanting uh, top dollar, sure. uh, produce it in Arabic. Give us the Arabic version and we'll pay top dollar for it. But we have to purchase it, we have to uh, acquire it, we have to translate it, we have to uh, send it to the dubbing, we sure. have to do all that to it and make sure that it is appropriate for, for our target audience. So, Got you. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Um,
Carol, we decided when we were talking about this session before that, that people um, probably had a pretty good idea of what the BBC is. So we've um, relieved Carol from the onus responsibility of a two-hour lecture on the BBC, <laughs> uh, although she can basically do that later this afternoon if there are people who are interested. So Carol, um, why don't you just show us some of the programmes you've uh, been acquiring at the yes, BBC? Yes, I've put together a um, short tape of three clips, each of which I hope demonstrates a specific point about the sort of thing we look for in our acquisition strategy on the BBC. Louis XIV, so powerful he took his name from the sun itself. So dominant, he made the haughtiest aristocrats bend to his will. Throughout a long and turbulent life, Louis sought magnificence in all things. He strived for it in love, in battle, and in art. But above all, he wanted magnificence at Versailles by creating a building so spectacular it would outshine any palace on earth. Taken from intimate memoirs and official records, this is the story of how a king's obsession created one of the wonders of the world. On the 22nd of July, 1951, at four o'clock in the morning, the stray dogs Gypsy and Desic were put into their places inside the rocket's hermetically sealed cabin. Ten minutes before dawn, the edges of the test site at Kapustin Yar were lit up by a burst of flames. These are unique pictures of the first space flight. You can see clearly what was happening to the animals in the cabin of the rocket. From the moment of liftoff, the pressure is tremendous. The dogs can barely hold their heads up. The engine stops, and inside the cabin, the dogs experience weightlessness. Then the cabin hurtles back towards the earth at great speed. At seven kilometers above the earth, there is a sudden jolt as the parachute opens. Korolev only allowed medics at the landing spot. As Alexander Seryapin approached the cabin, he didn't know whether or not his little charges were still alive. The Vatican, a tiny sovereign state in the middle of Rome. The focus of the faith of a billion people. But the Vatican's inner life has been shrouded in secrecy until now. For the first time, the Vatican has allowed cameras deep into a world few have ever seen, filming a unique community of faith. The men, women, and children who devote their lives to serving the Pope and his guests the curators who tend its treasures, the archivists who guard its secrets. This is the interrogation of the 12th of April, 1633. From the bones of St. Peter to the marvels of the Sistine Chapel, this is a journey into the hidden world of the Vatican. I hope that's given everybody some idea of the range of the sort of programmes we buy. And before I draw some lessons from those three clips, I thought it might be useful to actually just say a few words about the BBC's acquisition strategy, because it's really quite different from um, my fellow panellists here, largely due, due to our funding structure, which is, of course, the licence-free. 
Now, um, the BBC is, of course, not what we would call a publisher broadcaster, in that our core purpose is not to buy in programmes. In fact, um, on the straight acquisitions front, we currently have a 2% cap in the licence fee payer pound of programmes that we are allowed to buy in. Having said that, it's very important, I think, to make the point that that doesn't mean that the BBC is just making all its own programmes. We really do engage actively with the international market, in, but of, more often through the reverse co-production side. Um, reverse co-production is a unique BBC term, which means uh, a programme that's been commissioned by another broadcaster but the BBC invests in that programme. In BBC terminology, a co-production would mean a programme that the BBC makes and comes to a market like this and tries to sell. So um, uh, uh, alongside strands such as uh, This World, who are constantly working with other broadcasters, we do engage in the market, but not usually through the mechanism of um, a distributor. Um, I chose those three clips for very specific reasons, really to, to demonstrate to everybody the way that we actually work uh, with the international market. Um, Versailles was the, the, the first clip you saw. Um, that um, was produced by Les Films DC and the major funder was France 2. Now, when Versailles started out, it was a drama completely in French. And of course, it was rather difficult to explain to BBC Two why the BBC Two audience would want to see a drama entirely in French. They thought I'd lost my marbles slightly. So uh, what we did is we worked with Les Films DC and France 2 to make a version specifically for the BBC. Uh, we put quite a lot of funding into making that version. The, um, the active dialogue in French was changed to ambient dialogue. We put an English narration on because English audiences, the killing accepted, are notoriously bad at reading subtitles. So the point I wanted to make about Versailles was if you've got something that's absolutely glorious, but you feel wouldn't work for the BBC audience. We're not people that will simply say, oh, well, that doesn't work for us. We're constantly looking for potential. We're looking for funding. And um, indeed, I was fascinated earlier on by the uh, response to Simon's question, when most people thought things were getting better. I actually agree with you, and I'll tell you why I agree with you. It's because there's a paradox here. In, in uh, times of increased uh, budgetary cuts, a lot of broadcasters, including the BBC, are looking more and more and more into co-funding, getting together with other broadcasters, buying things in, and then I can see a real trend here to actually invest, as we did in Versailles, a number of broadcasters, and then each broadcaster goes off and makes their own version. So um, that is, I think, a really good opportunity for everybody as we approach the challenges um, of next year. Um, the second clip, Space Dogs, I use that to illustrate another point, um, which is that what we particularly look for in BBC acquisitions are programmes that it would be very difficult for the BBC to make itself and programmes that have unique access to a particular source. Now, uh, Space Dogs was from uh, uh, Russian television, uh, brought to us by the consultant uh, Bill Peck. We do work very closely with, um, with our esteemed uh, consultants in, in our acquisition strategy. And it, in the archive you saw there of the dogs inside the rocket, that archive, to my knowledge anyway, had never been seen in the West before. And again, it was commissioned because it was something that Westerners, that the BBC wouldn't usually have access to. So what it did is that it offered a very fresh perspective to our anniversary moon season. So we, you know, we had all the standard stuff, all the Neil Armstrong landing on the moon, small step for me, but this actually gave it a very international, fresh, original perspective. And that's really what we look for in our acquisitions. Um, the final programme, um, Vatican, uh, The Hidden World, again, that was something that the BBC itself would find quite difficult to do, mainly because, of course, 
you'll notice it was brought in from Bavaria in television, and the Pope is, of course, Bavarian. And actually, they got a fantastic access over a year to the Vatican, and we immediately, the, the, the Pope visited Britain last year, saw that as a potential programme that the BBC would find it very difficult to make. But again, we actually, although it was an acquisition, we got involved with the broadcasters fairly early on, um, and we had a very good relationship with Bavarian Television and Teamworks, and again, ended up with two different versions, a version specifically targeted to the BBC demographic, and a version specifically made for the Bavarian demographic. So just really, I think, to sum up what I'm saying is that, yes, you'll, you'll read quite a lot about the BBC doesn't buy much in, but there's two things that, that, that I want to leave you with. The first is, is that we do work with international companies the whole time, although not always in the context of uh, a, a buying through a distributor. And secondly, if you've got anything fresh, original, that only you could do, in other words, there has to be a reason for the BBC to buy something in rather than making it itself, please, please do come to us and uh, we would love to hear from you. Great, that, that's, that's very clear. Just one question, uh, Carol. You have regular conversations with the four key controllers, BBC yes. One, BBC Two, BBC Three, BBC Four, two of whom actually knew uh, uh, in the jobs. Anything that they're saying to you that you think you can share with this audience uh, about things that they're looking for uh, opportunities in the schedule, any, anything yes. in that area? Yes. Um, now, um, first of all, a, bro a broader point. Um, when I have my routines with the controllers, often we have, again, the focus on how can we maintain the quality of product with a reduced budget. So that, again, goes back to the point of let's get together, let's, let's, let's club together and make this fantastic product. And the controllers uh, constantly have their eye out for that. Um, on a more negative note, what the controllers don't like <laughs> is, um, uh, uh, I'll give a specific example. We, uh, I saw this fantastic film the other day on anorexia, which is a huge issue in the UK. Marvellous, but it was made in America. And I had a long discussion uh, with the controller about it, and what became evident was, well, actually, the licence fee payer is going to question why on earth we took a subject of global mm. importance but saw it from the American perspective. So this is the key thing. What we don't want is programmes that happen to come from another country. So if you look at all three of those clips, there was a reason that Versailles came from France. <laughs> there was a reason that Space Dogs came from, the, um, from Russia. And there was a reason that um, Vatican came from Bavarian television. So that's, and also, I'll just, uh, just throw in a couple of things that, um, big things that are coming up in 2012. Of course, London 2012, Olympics, you know, any, well, that's going to be absolutely huge. Um, Probably the other big one is the Dickens Bicentennial. Again, that's probably more Anglo-centric in approach. Um, I just think some ideas, we've got something, a big season on Afghanistan. But we're trying to actually up our business portfolio in really interesting programs about business. And um, lastly, the internet. We're looking at the internet for, for next year and the issues surrounding that. So I hope that gives you some sort of flavour, but do please come to us if there's anything that you think might fit our criteria for our, our acquisition strategy. OK, that, that's very helpful, Carol. Thanks for that. Lauren, you've been sitting patiently. Thank you. Uh, so let's hear about um, uh, Planet and Canopus. Yes, Planet. So, uh, the Canopus the documentary channels uh, under the Planet flag, uh, flag brand uh, will show a clip to give you a flavor of the channels. It's a, an original clip, so uh, I apologize for that. It's in French. Uh. <laughs> Go on. Au printemps, Planète voit les choses en grand. Voici l'histoire de l'année 2010 telle que l'on ne vous l'a jamais contée. C'est une forte tempête qui s'annonce sur toute la moitié nord du pays. On peut rien contre la nature. C'est une épreuve redoutable que la nature nous a envoyée. 
les méduses de Chizen envahissent les côtes japonaises par centaines de millions. La pêche ne nous rapporte plus rien. Ce n'est pas un océan propre. Il y a une tendance claire, la quantité de plastique augmente de façon exponentielle. Qu'est-ce qu'on fait de ce problème Nous jouons aux limites de ce qui est permis à l'être humain. Le président Sadi Carnot vient inaugurer l'exposition universelle. Il salue le grand ingénieur Gustave Eiffel, à qui nous devons la tour de 300 mètres. Pour avoir une chance de réussir, ils devaient parcourir le plus de distance possible en un minimum de temps. Sinon, ils étaient fichus. L'Allemagne est désormais coupée en deux. Pour moi, il existait deux mondes. Plus jamais ça. La dissuasion nucléaire est au cœur de la notion d'indépendance nationale. Faire la guerre pour imposer la paix. Elle avait un impact incroyable sur les gens. C'est la rareté qui en fait l'intérêt. Ça fait partie des pièces les plus exceptionnelles de l'horlogerie. Quelques centaines de milliers d'euros. Qu'est-ce qui peut bien se cacher derrière tout ça Dès que j'ai su qu'il y avait cet événement, je suis venu pour être témoin de ce spectacle. À cet instant-là, c'était merveilleux. C'était comme un miracle. C'était pour moi une deuxième naissance, une renaissance, je crois. Talassa vous donne rendez-vous avec le grand spectacle des océans. Il a passé une vie d'homme à faire aboutir un rêve, celui de faire voler un bateau de 5 tonnes. Je vais entrer dans l'histoire, regardez bien Si je tombe, je meurs, il n'y a pas plus extrême. Êtes-vous prêt C'est encore mieux que dans mes rêves Quand je reçois un appel, je suis tout de suite en alerte. J'ai pensé que j'allais brûler vif. On a envie de tout sauver. Je suis un survivant. L'avocat, c'est un emmerdeur. C'est un empêcheur de juger en gros. Avocat, avant tout. Convaincre, convaincre. Il faudrait souvent garde des sauf font une ou deux réformes. Moi, j'ai souhaité les faire toutes en même temps. L'audience est ouverte, vous pouvez vous asseoir. Vous êtes poursuivi pour avoir exercé une atteinte sexuelle, détruit un supermarché. Ils n'ont pas envie d'acquitter Colonna. Un innocent est en prison. Cocaine. Okay. Cocaine. Okay. Cocaine okay. and the money. The money. Les coulisses de la justice par la petite porte et par de grands experts. OK, so uh, here you have it pretty uh, dense and uh, intense look at what we, what we show on the channel. So a, pre uh, a quick presentation of Planet, which is the, the leader channel in France. I will skip very quickly on what we have on, uh, on the different slots. Uh, so we have discovery uh, team the documentaries, wildlife, blue chip, big international productions, aviation, which is science and and technology, historical aviation documentaries. Projection, it's more character, uh, personal viewpoint, uh, author documentaries from festivals. Uh, Grand Ecran, those are the big budget productions. Uh, we are involved in the Versailles that you saw, the French version. Um, civilization, it's ancient history, uh, more antiques, reenactments sometimes, uh, current affairs on uh, our social uh, slot, uh, society, history, mainly series uh, and uh, big uh, historical events, very concerning for the, for the French audience. Uh, we were the second broadcaster after uh, the big uh, France 2 success uh, um, apocalypse. And then uh, the last one is, a, is a, an internal production, is a, a magazine show. Uh, Planet Talassa, as you can have seen, on, you have seen on, on the clip, is a, a channel dedicated to the people 
that live uh, uh, close to the sea and they have their life related to the sea, uh, underwater wildlife, uh, also discovery and uh, uh, natural history documentaries, uh, travel and uh, evasion, we say it. Planet No Limit is the channel that we have created for uh, a younger uh, targeted audience, uh, adrenaline driven, uh, factual entertainment programs. Uh, you can easily see from, uh, from the clip what, uh, what style of programs we try to show. We are very uh, interested in new uh, kind of writing, uh, editing, and offering new styles, character-driven uh, factual programs. And finally, uh, Planet Justice, uh, which is, of course, uh, we are producing quite a lot in France. We need to be uh, close to, the, um, to the, the, the subjects which are directly related to the, to the French justice system, but we are buying uh, internationally uh, court uh, affair crimes stories and uh, uh, portraits of people that work in the judic judicial uh, system and uh, all this universe. That's more Brilliant. or less, Brilliant. More or less what we... Brilliant. What that, that, that's thank and thanks to all the panelists for being uh, amazingly good on time. Just one very quick uh, question, though, before we come to the audience. Um, as a very rough percentage, how much of your programming is originated and produced by French production companies in French for your networks, and how much of it is acquired internationally, either as commissions, co-productions, or straight acquisitions, just as a very rough guide? The rough guide is quite good because we have a target to respect, which is 40% of French productions and 60% of international acquisitions. We can go behind the 40% yeah. with the French productions, but yeah. not below. This is the French law. Okay, so there's a, there's a, there's a floor of 40%. Yes, 40% right. must be. In the same way as your floor is 2% uh, of acquisitions of the budget. Okay, that's really helpful. Can we have the lights up, please? Um, and this is one of the very few uh, panels I've ever chaired where we haven't actually um, asked a few people to ask a question uh, just to get it going. So I hope that there are some questions. You've been sitting very patiently. Has anybody got a question? And if you put your hand up, I presume there's a, a stick mic, and uh, if you can just um, give a thumbnail sketch in under 30 seconds of who you are and uh, what your company is. So has anybody, does anybody want to kick off? Yes, the lady here. And can we just take one other question, the next one after that? Is anybody? Great, thank you. Uh, hello. Hi. I'm, I'm Di Condors from Australia, Mayfield Productions. We have a documentary about Vincent van Gogh. Uh, my husband is related to Vincent van Gogh. Would Al Jazeera consider that a European type of art, mind you, he's a global name, um, for their type of programming, or are arts not quite the focus? OK, the first um, unambiguous pitch of the, of the morning. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Very nicely slipped in. Hello from Australia. Hello from Australia. Hello, from Hello. Australia. <laughs> Hello, Australia. Uh, definitely arts is something that we're looking into and a character like Van Gogh would be somebody that would be very interested to uh, find out more. I'm sure we can uh, take this conversation uh, we've got with us here at the head of production. We've got our channel manager, Mr. Ahmed Mahfouz. Uh, so definitely, yeah, we will be interested in uh, learning more about the, uh, what you've got uh, to offer us. Okay, the uh, question yes, I've uh, okay. been um, this is a question for Delta Zero. I, in past times when I've discussed programming with your representatives and co-production programming, um, it's been a bit difficult to reach uh, some sort of uh, agreement because I, my understanding is you want world rights and it's difficult to have windows for free-to-air broadcasters in other countries first. Could you talk about that, please? Um, again, we've, we've, our, our whole team is here. Uh, we've all arrived uh, just a couple of days ago. Not only that, but we've got a stand in uh, MIP TV. Uh, so you're more than welcome to uh, grab any of us uh, and we could uh, definitely talk about that. Uh, the rights issue thing is, um, yeah, it's a bit, you know, um, 
we can take that into detail rather than bore everybody. Uh, okay, well, like it. Uh, it may not be that boring. Let's just... Um, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. to get uh, out of it would, here, would, 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 would one of your colleagues like to just address that? Because that does seem like a pretty, pretty basic question up there. So if we can get any elucidation on that, in the hall now, that would be lovely, otherwise you know where the stand is, but would one of your colleagues like to address the question of uh, the point about uh, are, are you asking for effectively global, global yes, rights? Yes, we are asking for, for global rights We're, because, you know, our network is just not just Al Jazeera documentary, yeah. but we've got, you know, like we, Al Jazeera documentary, we concentrate on the MENA region. Yeah. But of course, we've got uh, other uh, uh, channels in our network that would like the music, next music stations, uh, for example, with, uh, the English channel have taken it. I'm sure uh, uh, other channels would be very interested in, in, in also broadcasting it. Uh, so we are, yeah, we look always for global rights. We're a global, uh, as I said, our mission is, is, is more global, but focused on, on also local issues. So that, that, that's, you know, that's the matter of uh, the nature of the uh, uh, umbrella organization and the whole network. Okay. Do you stage. want to come back, or you? Yeah. No, I, I, the only reason that I asked the question is because during your talk you talked about co-production. Now, by its very nature, that implies there'll be other broadcasters involved. I mean, for example, if the BBC wanted to, if we had a program that was uh, of interest to an Australian broadcast and a program of interest to, say, Carol at the BBC, um, could the ABC and the BBC exercise their rights before you exercise yours. Would you be interested or must you be the first in, in the primary and the, uh, have a premier window in your territories? Uh, definitely in our territories, we, we, we would want exclusive, you know, like... In the, MENA? The, uh, yeah, in the MENA region, yeah. as Al Jazeera documentary, that, that definitely we'll, we'd want that. Um, I'm sure for the global side, we've also got uh, our acquisition persons and our uh, people coming from Al Jazeera English during MIP TV and uh, also from Al Jazeera Arabic, we've got some representatives here that we can, you know, discuss with them and see what we can, if there's any compromise. Great, okay. Um, next question. Um, anybody? Somebody at the back, yes. Just, just, yes, maybe, could you stand up so that we can? Sure. Would you mind? Um, Thank you. My name's Christine Dewey. I'm with Rocco Films. We distribute a small number of um, high-quality documentaries, and I wondered if each of you could address the issue of catch-up streaming rights, VOD rights, and whether you um, choose that to be a strategy where you pay extra for those rights, or do you still view those as part of a broadcast license, and do you then expect not to pay additional for those rights. So, Bod, is it, is it part of the basic license? Fee? Right. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, Michelle. Sure. Um, it's a pen. At, <laughs> at Nat Geo, um, we definitely consider VOD to be part of our um, broadcast fee, um, what we pay. Our non-standard rights include VOD, online, mobile. Um, so, yes, absolutely. Um, we most of the reason is to protect our premiere. Our main um, strategy, we're really only focusing on our linear television. However, we need to protect our premiere and um, VOD is, it's becoming so much more popular. And I, I mean, for me personally, when I watch TV, I watch a lot of my television now on VOD and not necessarily just regular broadcast. So. Um, I think it's really important for us to hold on to those rights and um, for them to be included in our fee. Thank you. Sure. Mustafa. Right, okay. Uh, we're, we're just looking into that right now, but we're looking to work with our uh, uh, IT department to actually look at how we can uh, geolock Yes. Uh, to the region, so yeah. this is something that's quite it's, it's quite a challenge, and we're just picking up uh, with the uh, with with the, with our guys in IT. How can we do that? And just to geolock because we've got some issues there that we need to sort out. But we definitely are looking for mobile and 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 you know VOD, uh, VOD uh, for for any licenses in the future. Do you currently have, I couldn't remember from that uh, tier of uh, service, mm -hmm. additional uh, new media services? We do, we do we have, do. we do have a, yes, we do have a dedicated uh, video uh, uh, vault on, on our, on, yeah, player that's on right. our website. But again, we've only got most, of, it's just our productions, nothing that we acquire because again of the rights issues and the geolocking within, uh, within our website. Yeah. 
Hi, Christine. Um, no, at the BBC, we have something called the iPlayer, which is essentially a seven-day catch-up service. And when we buy a programming, we do ask for iPlayer rights. However, having said that, on an acquisitions basis, if it's not possible, and it sometimes isn't possible, we do have a waiver, but that would affect uh, the license fee. One other point, actually, related to rights that I think it's quite important to understand if you're selling to the BBC, though, is that second windows in the UK area are almost impossible for us to take. And the reason for that um, is that we have to guard against the license fee payer saying, why am I paying my license fee for something I saw on Discovery three weeks ago? So second windows are usually very dicey. But on acquisitions, we really do usually ask just for the UK exclusive UK terrestrial rights plus seven day catch up. Request uh, catch up TV rights, and uh, uh, we, it's a service that we have to, to offer to our subscribers, especially when you are a PA TV channel. Now, uh, everybody wants to, to watch uh, a program uh, when he wants, uh, and not only when the, the channel is, uh, is showing it. So, we have a, a, a 30 day period after the first broadcast when you can uh, uh, re, re screen the program. And uh, uh, we cannot pay for that any extra fee because we don't have any extra revenues from that. It's just uh, uh, something that we, we need to include to keep our, our position uh, against uh, the free uh, and digital terrestrial TVs. Yeah. Okay, can, can I then just ask, um, the following Christine's question, just ask the audience here, is there anybody as a producer or distributor in this room who's earned any money at all from VOD distribution, either through a share of revenue or a share of pre-roll or a share of any display around any of their programs? So, so we've got one, two. It's interesting, isn't it? So would, would you mind me asking you, um, where, um, uh, the lady uh, in the third row, where, what that platform was and what the type of revenue deal was that you managed to earned from? <laughs> Hello there. Um, it was a um, series that we made for Digital First that went, then went to Channel 4 um, and we super distributed it across the net. So it was VOD but not quite in the sense that these guys have been talking about. And we just got a share of pre-roll and advertising around it. Um, we had an exclusive um, partnership with uh, iVillage yeah. Uh, globally, so they mm. they had a kind of premiere online before it went to broadcast. Got you. And so we spent all revenue on that. So is there nobody here who's placed any of their content uh, with YouTube, for example, uh, under the YouTube uh, content partnership deals and got revenue from from YouTube, which is a, a well, in fact there's somebody in the uh, palais that uh, you can all speak to that has, has nobody nobody done that. Yes, yeah, sorry, you've done that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, interesting. Okay, um, next question. Any other questions? I have a question. Sorry, is there somebody? Yes, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I didn't see you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name's Zachary Miller. I'm an American based in Paris with a French company. Uh, my, my question is for Michelle at National Geo. Uh, basically, is National Geo looking more toward a series or one off? Uh, feature-length documentaries. Is there like a 50-50 or as far as what do you buy? Uh, I've got a um, basically a two uh, feature-length doc, uh, but I'd also like it to be, a, it's basically in po post-production right now, but I like the idea to be a series. So it's an adventure travel series with uh, experts uh, traveling the world doing, uh, finding out on mysteries. But what's your preference, uh, series or uh, docs at this point? I'd say that um, our preference is definitely series right now. Um, and just to touch on feature docs really quickly, uh, we've tried them multiple different ways and multiple times, and they're very, very hard for us. It's not something that viewers turn to our channel for. Um, I love them. I love watching feature docs. I would do it all day long. Um, but it's just not something we generally buy. However, that being said, there are those 
documentaries that are just so phenomenal and so great and really do are able to hit kind of a certain demo. We just did Restrepo, uh, which was a feature doc, and um, that aired in the States and did phenomenally well for us. Um, so it's not something that I would ever say, please don't pitch it to us, but it's just something to be wary of. But I would be happy to talk to you about yours, especially if you're turning it into a series. Okay, we've got just under three minutes for a couple of other quick pitches, if anybody, anybody fa fancies throwing, throwing their names in. Uh, but do we have, uh, seriously, there's a chap at the, the back, I think, with one more question. I've probably got time for one very quick question after that. So uh, I am Dimitris Fotiadis from uh, White Fox Chris. And uh, my question is, uh, if we have a series of documentaries uh, that has received an award from a festival or somewhere else, is that interesting for you? Does it make uh, the deal easier for you? Do awards it's help? Is more attractive? Does anybody want to pick that up? Yes. Is this motherhood and apple pie, I, this question? I'll pick that up. Um, Storyville at the BBC, Nick Fraser, actually his main remit is to go around festivals and invest in award-winning films, either on, a, on an early basis or a later one. So yes, actually an award will make a huge difference. It will get you much higher up the pile. And we do, and Storyville actually specializes in that very specific thing, the award-winning narrative feature-length documentary film. Okay. Just one, is there one final question? Somebody's got a burning question they want to ask? Going, going, go on. Can I then just ask Mustafa one question very quickly, and then we'll come to one question for the whole panel. Uh, events in MENA, are they fundamentally changing your strategy, uh, or um, actually does uh, Al Jazeera continue on in pretty, the same, pretty much the same way as a broadcaster? I think we'll continue, especially the documentary channel. Yeah. Uh, definitely, it's a very exciting time for us in the, in the region. And I think it's just the right time now to uh, look at how we can um, grab the opportunity and push forward with a, a stronger filmmaking attitude to show the people uh, what, what, what can come out of this region, from the region, uh, to an international and global audience. Uh, that we've got a voice, and it is a positive voice. It is not a negative voice, and that uh, you know, I think that's something that we will definitely look into and try to uh, leverage. Great. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, to finish each member of the panel uh, one question, which is uh, they've talked a lot about the shows that they've acquired and the things they're really proud of, and we've seen some great stuff. I'm going to ask them a question, which is this: uh, if you could have acquired one single film or series that you didn't acquire because it went to one of your competitors, what series would you have wanted to acquire? What series would you have killed to have on your channels? For me, it's Ice Road Truckers that went on uh, DTT. Uh, Ice Road Truckers? Yes. Right. Because, okay. because uh, it was a big success yeah. uh, uh, in terms of marketing. Yeah. But uh, it's not exactly what uh, we were very hesitating and it's not exactly the style of programs to be Okay. Sure, so it's, okay, it's Carol. Um, I would have killed to get uh, Stephen Hawkins' universe led by Darlow Smithson because, again, looking at our acquisition strategy of, of uh, programs complementing our core programming, it would have made a wonderful companion piece to um, the Brian Cox, Brian Cox series. Yeah. And um, I was very sorry to, 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 to lose that, but we were simply outbid. Okay. Uh, I think uh, the uh, untold uh, stories of the history of the America, the Oliver Stone uh, series, yes. Yes. that's definitely something I'm, uh, I would have loved to uh, uh, finish the deal before this met, but we haven't had uh, uh, the, you, you know. still have time, it's not uh, finished. I t yeah, well, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe we will You've do that. You've just upped the price slightly. Yeah. <laughs> have I? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> not really. I'm that's not selling it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's why you're not selling it. Okay. Michelle. Um, I would have really liked to have been able to acquire Polar Bear, Spy on Ice, uh, which is actually a BBC show. Um, it is just a great way um, of looking at, it's very unique, of looking at polar bears and this natural history and the science of them and it's just, and conservation. It hits so many different topics that are so great for us in such a unique fashion that um, it, it would have been really great, but unfortunately we can't. Okay, brilliant. Okay, well, can I thank uh, Michelle, Mustafa, Carol, and Laurent for being a great panel. Thank you.
And uh, can I thank you all and wish you the best of luck in the coming 12 months, and we'll see what it looks like this time next year. Okay, thank you.